Hello, everyone, and welcome to our ongoing series of conversations with industry leaders who are discussing how their businesses and their organizations are adapting to the transformative changes that are happening in a collective marketplace uh, due to climate change. So my name is Ian Jarvis. I'm the executive director of Climate Challenge Network, which runs Greening Healthcare Program and also similar collaborative programs K-12 schools, municipalities, and post-secondary educational facilities. I'm joined today and delighted to welcome Ryan Duffy uh, and Tim Schneider uh, from Blackstone Energy Services. Uh, Ryan is the CEO and founder, and Tim is president of the Energy Solutions Group, which is the specific uh, a group that uh, we're interested in with respect to engaging with hospitals through uh, greening healthcare. Ryan, I want to start with you. And can you tell us how you've seen the requirements, the interests, the concerns of hospitals change, say, over the past five years or the past decade as a result to response to climate change? Are you hearing anything on the ground yet? What are people telling you? Where's the market going right now? Thank you, Ian. Yeah, glad to be here. Thanks for having us. Uh, I, I think the answer to your question is uh, there definitely have been a growing number of concerns on the hospitals. And depending on where you want to start, five years or 10 years, if you do go back 10 years, I think that I think you can quite easily. Um, we started off with sort of a minimal impact where um, a lot of the hospitals were asked to deal with compliance around energy intensity, uh, things like 39711, conservation planning, things like that. But then in the recent, I'll call it uh, years here, maybe the five-year mark, we saw the, on, the uh, introduction of the Net Zero Accountability Act. We had the carbon levy also come up, both of which have brought uh, a growing amount of concerns to all the hospitals and not only the folks that are running the hospitals, but to the C-suite and to the, uh, to the boards. Um, the boards in particular, this Net Zero Accountability Act, coupled with changes with the IFRS reporting, SEC, um, you know, there's tons of concerns there about are people doing uh, the right thing? What fiduciary duties uh, do they have? And there are questions that they're all asking uh, their staff is how do we get to net zero now that we've got this, this obligation? And um, the, the last one I'll throw out, um, Ian, just because it's super timely around the carbon levy. It's been around since 2018 and it's been increasing about 20% per year uh, since then. Last year, the average hospital spent almost a half a million dollars in, uh, in carbon levy or carbon tax. And this April is when the carbon levy is set to increase again. And there was a lot of political tension last week as in the week before, as the uh, Liberal government was under a non-confidence vote um, and the Liberal government succeeded. So they, they passed through. And um, what does that mean? What it means is come April 1st, the, the increase is going to be there. And uh, it also probably means that the federal election has been delayed um, about a year as well, too. So, yeah, I think it's fair to say that... Uh, climate change is definitely a mounting concern for hospitals. For Blackstone, how, how have your services, how is your market positioning, how is your approach uh, evolved along with this um, as, as, as the market is shifting and questions are being asked and those things are moving forward? I think from a market position perspective, we really haven't changed in the last decade and, it, and we can go back almost that far. Uh, back in 2016, we set our company vision to take all of our clients to net zero by 2050. So that's, uh, as you know, not an easy thing to do. So like any good vision, it's bold. And uh, we're still working on it. And we're still, we're still working hard. But as far as evolving the services, I think we've always tried to keep things fresh. And certainly in the last uh, handful of years, the markets are testing us on that every every day there seems to be something new. But what, what got it for us, for me in particular, um, after witnessing 
uh, what happened in Paris back in 2015, when we uh, were able to go to um, COP22 in Morocco the following year, we were actually introduced as a decarbonization catalyst. And I'd never heard of that, never thought of that before, but it stuck with me. So um, not only did it gel well with our, our vision, but it really has shaped how we have changed and evolved our services. And we were lucky because we were coming from a point of being um, an energy commodity advisor already for most of the hospitals. Um, so that was, we already had that engagement with them. We were already looking at risk management um, tools and solutions. So that was super helpful. So beyond energy efficiency, which is a lot of your background, how are hospitals approaching decarbonization? Once again, is, is it on their radar screens yet? Are they still in the world of just keeping their hospitals operational and functioning and replacing plant when it's due at the end of life? Or are those conversations around low carbon alternatives, are they starting to appear? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's all of the above. And uh, I mean, as you know, uh, decarbonization and energy conservation continues. Uh, it's really a financially driven conversation and, and how um, most of our clients are uh, trying to understand how to tackle these related issues. I mean, um, climate change and, and uh, decarbonization is definitely on the radar for almost all of them. Most of the sector clients are approaching how to understand and address this issue through various forms of investigations like uh, ECDMs, climate action plans. And, uh, and when they're moving forward with a project, typically they'll engage in an investment uh, grade energy study. Um, in all cases, all of them are seeking clarity on most, uh, I, I'll say the most sensible way forward. Um, the climate emergency uh, is, is apparent with everyone, both I think at their home, in their homes uh, and at their work. So we're seeing the will and intent lining up with the regulatory compliance in, in a new way because of this awareness. And, and I, I'm gonna say concerns with their families, um, their, their, their homes, their, their livelihood, friends, and, and maybe even the planet's survival as a whole. So I'd, I'd say um, our clients, um, if, they're, if they're not prepared, um, there's, they're, 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 they're finding this as an issue. And in many cases, some of them have been mandated to assess decarbonization as a result of the uh, federal and provincial legislation. Um, along with other directives like BPS and GHG reporting. Yeah. Can you walk us through what does a representative capital project look like? What does practical and affordable look like for a major retrofit of existing hospital today? We're currently um, in different phases of implementation at, at a number of major hospitals, focusing on um, large scale deep energy and carbon retrofits. Um, and as you know, um, hospitals are an energy intensive operation, uh, one of the most intensive energy operations that we, we, we're faced with that side of industrial. So most, most of the heat, um, and again, Ian, uh, you know, looking at with you through a lot of the greening uh, healthcare benchmarking and some of the best performing hospitals, we're seeing um, many of them are using the heat that's generated and existing in the hospital and the fact that that can be recovered and reused and more often than not, uh, recommissioning of the existing systems combined with that heat recovery can result in up to 50 or 60% uh, carbon reductions. And we're, we're interested in the new service delivery models coming in a number of industries uh, as a result of adjusting to, again, the different requirements, uh, perhaps more integrated solutions. Uh, you'd mentioned a new business arrangement that you're working on. I, I think Tim just uh, kind of hinted at it bringing financing together with turnkey project delivery services. Can you tell us a bit more about what that looks like? It's a huge initiative. We're super proud of the team uh, that we've got to um, demonstrate to CIB and Enbridge that we've got what it takes to help um, deploy this kind of capital. And this is some of the largest amount of money that um, has been ever dedicated to this kind of an effort. So. We're super excited. Um, Tim's been working super close with the team at Enbridge and CIB to explore um, 
uh, putting the right kind of contracts in place, timing, managing expectations from more people than normal, I would say, because it's not just the managing the expectations of the client, but we've got all the, the funding side of things and uh, uh, all the trades, et cetera. But I don't know if there's, if you want to add to that, Tim? I think it's unique, Ian. Um, and, you know, at the last Greening Healthcare uh, conference, there was a lot of talk around, um, you know, how do you deal with these 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 um, deep retrofits, these very expensive um, investments? And and I think with Enbridge as an investor and and CIB uh, bringing this inexpensive long term funding, which is blended with the Enbridge investment to help bring down the capital cost, it's it's a it's a unique form of funding that's uh, got a time and place. I think the unique value is um, the money is is lower uh, and available at longer terms. Um, that many of our clients can get at traditional banks or or um, even um, secure capital within their own organizations, which, as you know, is a, is, is an ongoing challenge, especially with uh, a lot of the, the more recent uh, financial um, challenges that we're seeing right across all sectors. So I think what's interesting about the the, the program that we put to the CIB, but along with our Enbridge and Blackstone aggregator fund is, We've got more suitable length of term, so longer term funding, 20, 25, and even up to 50 years uh, we can we can offer. And um, there's a lot of flexibility in that funding that allows our, our clients, and in this case, hospitals, to pay down the debt as grants or incentives or other funds become available. So how, how is Blackstone responding to the, the climate challenge? Uh, where do climate change sustainability fit within your mission, your strategic planning, your corporate values, how Blackstone represents itself to the outside world. Uh, where does all that fit? Well, I have to say that our, our company vision of taking our clients to net zero by 2050 is definitely a guiding light. And it's, it is a first filter. It was tough to put that out there back in 2016, because we do work with some of the largest polluters or largest energy users in, in the marketplace. But um, from an approach perspective, like our response, I guess, to answer the question maybe a little bit better is we've decided to take a leadership role to lead through innovation and responsibility too. I think that's an underlying current that you'll, you'll, you'll hear um, these days. We've done all sorts of things. We've gone out and we've made an investment in such a, a diverse skill set of people uh, across all different uh, sectors to sort of cultivate this climate crusader team that uh, that we formed here and uh, diverse backgrounds and genders and regions and everything trying to foster the best practices and um, and uh, information out there because it's we are in uncharted territory still as far as trying to decarbonize uh, the world, let alone a single facility, right? Um, we've done other things. We launched a uh, sustainability app, app called uh, EcoBoss, and that's uh, designed to help uh, leaders and uh, folks within facilities or campuses or you name it, drive the change management side of it, because that is that is a big uh, element. Um, We've also, uh, we've got a program, Enerval program, our decarbonization program. Uh, we've humanized that. We do a lot of stakeholder engagement so people understand, you know, how this change, albeit sometimes could be disruptive, how it can work uh, within their facility. Um, in 2022, we released our first ESG report uh, showcasing our commitment and transparency, accountability, et cetera. And we did this, of course, voluntarily. This we weren't mandated to do that. And we've got our second report coming out later this year. Um, and, and lastly, I think being that leader or taking that leadership uh, response to, to what's going on here really, uh, I think will help our clients in this energy transition and, you know, we're looking at all at different aspects of the energy value chain from the source of energy literally to the end where you get the governance side of it. And I think we, we do a good job of helping customers understand and appreciate uh, the whole energy value chain there. So thank you, Ryan. And uh, 
and thank you, Tim, for sharing. So yeah. uh, thank you. Be part of where we're going. Uh, to everyone else listening in, uh, stay tuned as the biggest energy transition in human history continues, which presents so many opportunities and responsibilities to everyone. Thanks for joining, and we'll talk to you next time.